Well, thanks so much for coming tonight. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with you uh, some of the things we cover in my uh, course um, that I teach regularly called uh, Women and Christianity. Uh, it's one of my favorite courses to teach, and uh, students uh, respond really well to it and really enjoy it, I think. We've gotten a few religious studies majors out of that class. I got, got hooked on religious studies after looking at um, just a broad survey of uh, images and ideas and realities of women from antiquity to the present um, in the history of Christianity. So um, I'll just uh, touch on a few things here and then maybe open it to um, some questions and discussion later on. So we'll start with um, the Christian Bible and thinking about women in Christianity. Um, even though the Christian Bible is comprised of the Old Testament based on the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, um, I think it's appropriate to start with the New Testament when thinking about women in Christianity because throughout Christian history, Christians have looked at the Old Testament through the prism of the New Testament, interpreted the Old Testament through uh, their understanding of the New Testament. So there's an uh, image of the New Testament, one of the oldest uh, New Testament manuscripts we have written in Greek. Uh, and the New Testament itself is really complex, as is the study of women in Christianity. Uh, the origins of Christianity and Christian texts um, take, um, are, are very um, complicated and take place over a period of time. You, um, for starters, you don't have any um, original manuscripts of Christian texts of the New Testament. They're all later copies. Uh, these are early texts were written on um, pap uh, papyri uh, that you know de denigrated, um, disintegrated, and so you had copyists recopying and recopying these texts over time. And so what you have now is a, a variety of later copies, um, various editions, copies that don't always match each other. Um, and then that's before you get to all the translation issues. Um, so studying the New Testament itself is really challenging and, and interesting in that way. Um, the complete New Testament canon and collection that we have today isn't listed in any early writings until later in the fourth century, um, over 300 years after the death of Christ himself, um, in a list by Bishop Athanasius. Um, talking about the canon being these 27 books of the New Testament. Um, so the earliest writings um, that appear in the New Testament canon that's finally put together over a 300 year period um, are the letters of Paul um, called the Epistles of Paul. And for anyone who knows anything about the history of Christianity, uh, he's an important figure to think about and, and look at when you study women in Christianity. Um, does anybody have um, any sense of Paul and his relationship with women or the influence he's had on the history of women in Christianity? Anybody want to throw out any ideas you have about Paul? Yeah. Uh, he supported them being at home or in tent coverings. Okay, so this idea of him uh, wanting women at home wearing head coverings, uh, long hair um, is sometimes associated with Pauline writings. Um, so certainly he's been associated with um, emphasizing a particular role for women to play and has been terribly influential in the role that women have had in the history of Christianity and in the history of the Western world since Christianity has shaped so much of Western society, uh, politics, and so on. He was not himself an original disciple of Jesus, um, but was a later convert after Jesus' death, uh, but was really influential in spreading one form of Christianity throughout the Mediterranean world, throughout the Roman Empire, and the form of Christianity he spread ultimately became the dominant form of Christianity that created the New Testament. Uh, so he, in many ways, is sort of the founding figure of the Christianity that we've all inherited today, um, that the, his version of Christianity is what took, even though there were multiple ideas about Christianity early on in the, in the early movement. So almost half of the books in the New Testament are attributed to him, um, and so he's a, a really, really important figure. Um, so his writings, his letters are written um, in the mid-first century, in the 50s CE, which is the same thing as AD, 50s of the Common Era. 
Um, and then his death is uh, in the 60s um, at the hands of the Roman Empire, as was the death of Jesus. There's just a map of his travels around the Mediterranean, uh, spreading the Christian message. And then he writes letters to those communities. Um, and those letters get preserved over time. After a while, later Christian communities start referring to his letters as scripture, having uh, some kind of divine authority. And eventually, they get placed in the New Testament. One thing that Christians have struggled with throughout the history of Christianity is how to reconcile these 14 different letters attributed to him when there are some really stark, apparent contradictions in different letters. And the language and sometimes even theology don't seem to harmonize um, like they would expect them to from the writings of one person. Uh, and this is true when it comes to looking at the way Paul wrote about women. Uh, here's one of the letters attributed to him, 1 Timothy, all the um, biblical texts here are taken from the New Revised Standard Version translation in RSV. Uh, and this is often people's image of Paul, the, this passage here, uh, image of Paul and the way he thought about women, where this text uh, says, let a woman learn in silence with full submission, and permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man, she is to keep silent. And then referencing the Adam and Eve story in the Old Testament in Genesis, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor, yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. So you have that prominent image of Paul's position on women on the one hand and some of the epistles. Um, on the other hand, you have other epistles of Paul's that um, seem to stand in contradiction to that ideal of, of woman. Uh, for example, in Romans, his epistle to the Romans, he talks about Phoebe, um, who's a deacon, um, and he tells the church that he's writing to to welcome her um, and to help her in whatever she may require from you, for she's been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. So this figure of a woman who's a, a leader in the church, who has some kind of authority and prominence that he's referencing, uh, and then you have passages like the one in Galatians, uh, where he's talking about how there are no social distinctions. There's no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So one uh, theological puzzle that um, Christians have had throughout history is uh, trying to reconcile this. Um, and various explanations have come up. Um, the one popular explanation is that this no longer male and female is referring to spiritual equality, but here on earth there's still gonna be social difference and there's still gonna be social hierarchies, even if there's no longer spiritual hierarchies in, in Christ Jesus. Um, so that's one way of harmonizing it. Uh, most contemporary biblical scholars have a different explanation for these apparent contradictions. Um, and most um, biblical scholars today um, would argue that there are several epistles attributed to Paul that he actually didn't write. Um, that there were epistles uh, that Christians have long attributed to him and still attribute to, attribute to him uh, that were actually written several decades after his death, maybe even 100 years after his death in the second century, and more accu accurately reflect the second century historical context rather than Paul's own historical context. And uh, First Timothy, uh, the a vast majority of biblical scholars would agree, um, is written at a later time, uh, not in the actual time of Paul, not actually written by Paul himself, even though it's attributed to him. Uh, and these other texts um, are the undisputed epistles, meaning scholars today don't dispute that Paul wrote them, that they fit the context of the first century of the 50s and 60s when Paul was writing and, and doing his traveling. Uh, and so uh, most scholars would agree, uh, universe, you know, almost universally, that Paul's the author of those texts. Uh, and so that's a simple explanation for the difference, that they're written by two different people in two different time periods and reflecting two different um, types of Christianity. And one thing that's interesting about that is you can see the evolution of Christian thinking about women and the role they should play in society and in church, um, even in the New Testament texts themselves that are written at different points throughout the early Christian period until they're all brought together in the New Testament canon.
So just to recap, um, you have epistles reflecting Paul's actual historical context, and then what some scholars would call the Deuteropauline, meaning a second Paul, someone writing in Paul's name, um, epistles reflecting a century later, the second century context. And it's even more complicated than that because, uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians, uh, some scholars have argued that there's insertions into the text that later copyists added um, that weren't Paul's original um, passages to try to harmonize them with the later texts. Okay, so early Christianity and the role women played in early Christianity um, evolves pretty dramatically over the first three centuries um, of Christian history. Uh, early Christianity kind of roughly dated from 30 around the time of Jesus' uh, crucifixion um, to 313, which is when Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, where the Roman Empire was now going to tolerate Christianity. Um, in this almost 300-year period, this early movement um, was vulnerable, it was very, very diverse. There was no one unified church with one unified scripture. Um, and it was quite vulnerable. Often people were meeting in houses and they didn't have official public structures and public roles. Um, and so some people have talked about how women had more of a role in these house churches and private spaces. Uh, some people have argued that this early uh, fresco here and from a catacomb in Rome is showing a woman uh, in one of the early Christian rituals of having a communal meal, meal and handing out the, the communal meal, meal and the Passover remembrance of Jesus. A lot of times uh, scholars will refer to the very early Jesus uh, Christian movement as the Jesus movement because early on it didn't see itself as something separate from Judaism but was a movement within Judaism. It takes a long time for it to separate and start to um, think of itself as a different religion than Judaism. Okay, so we go back to very earliest Christianity, before 70, during the time of Paul. Um, you have a very distinctive historical moment for Christianity that's quite different than the second century when those later Deuteropauline texts are written. Um, do anybody know off the top of your head the significance of the date 70, 70 CE? You get my A student here in my... Oh, someone, oh, go ahead, well, go ahead. I'll let you get the next one. <laughs> That's right. Is that what you were going to say? The destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by Romans, is a significant moment both for Christianity and Judaism. Both uh, redefine themselves and take on new identities after that uh, kind of apocalyptic event there. Uh, before um, 70, Early Christianity, um, as seen in the writings, the undisputed writings of Paul and, and other early source material, um, points to a religion that had apocalyptic expectations, that was expecting the immediate return of Christ, and that Jesus would return and wipe away this present evil world dominated by the Roman Empire and would restore the kingdom of God. Uh, and the undisputed Pauline epistles reflect someone who's expecting this world to pass away very quickly, and is quite distinct from the later Deuteropauline epistles where, where that author is no longer expecting that. Uh, so here's a passage from Paul um, in one of his undisputed epistles written during this early period uh, where he's suggesting to people that they don't bother marrying, getting married. Um, and uh, he's saying, you know, if you... If you, it's the famous verse, you know, if you're going to burn with passion, it's better to marry. But I would say stay as I am and don't get married. Uh, so he says, those who marry will experience distress in this life, and I would spare you that. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short, for the present form of this world is passing away. Uh, so there's really a clear expectation there that in this lifetime, this world is going to pass away, and that... Um, the appointed time of Christ's return is near. So just stay as you are. Don't make bonds with anything in this world because it's passing very soon. Paul didn't seem, if you look only at the undisputed epistles, he didn't really have any set social expectations for people in his movement because this society was passing away. Um, so he talks about women as his co-workers, that the most important thing is spreading the good news and the gospel, and all hands were needed on deck because the time is near when this world is going to pass away. 
Uh, there's one passage from Romans, which is one of the undisputed epistles, where he references a Junia, and there's been ongoing sort of controversy about was Junia really a woman? Um, and in some English translations, her name's changed to a male version of the name because translators couldn't believe it could be a, a woman. Um, but Paul says, greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Uh, here suggesting, um, like he does in other places, that women are there right by his side, spreading this message at great risk to themselves and to their life. Um, and uh, here the, the controversy later on becomes, could you call a woman an apostle? So in that context of the first century, these apocalyptic expectations, uh, spreading the message in spite of the danger it brought them, needing all hands on deck, expecting the social norms of this day to pass in this lifetime. Um, these verses kind of make sense, where the social distinctions of the Roman Empire, Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, are all passing. They don't matter anymore. Uh, because the, it's now we're entering into the Messianic Age. And in the Messianic Age, there's going to be a new order in Christ Jesus. Um, and he's calling upon women as well as men to take uh, a leadership role in spreading that good news. People like Phoebe. Okay, so those are early glimpses of the, the vulnerable and quite unformed early Christian movement. Um, they weren't digging in for the long haul. They weren't building institutions. They really weren't intentionally writing down texts because they expected this world to pass away. We have the letters of Paul because he just happened to be writing them to Christian communities that he was keeping up long distance relationships with during his travels, and then they preserved them, and eventually it ends up in the New Testament. After the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, uh, so Roman, um, arch uh, representing them taking away the treasures and the menorah from the temple that was destroyed. You see dramatic changes in Christianity, as you do with Judaism. Uh, and Christianity, after this point, uh, starts to uh, dig in for the long haul, to start creating some kind of order for the church um, so that this religion and, and message could be passed on from generation to generation. They start writing down the oral tradition that survived to this point about the stories about Jesus. This is when the Gospels start to be written. Um, and you have uh, the four Gospels that end up in the New Testament. Mark being the first one, even though it doesn't come first in the New Testament. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And then a whole proliferation of other Gospels that are written um, that don't end up in the New Testament. And many of them discovered not until the 20th century after those are suppressed uh, in the 4th century. Um, so you see, uh, after 70, this accommodation to the norms of Greco-Roman society, trying to become a respectable institution, um, increasingly becoming a public institution in the Greco-Roman world, and this real move towards institutionalization and creating something that's going to last over time, uh, something that's going to withstand persecution and scorn over time. Uh, and one thing that you see is this real clear direction in um, curtailing um, women's public activity during this moment. Um, at least for a prominent strain of Christianity, it's still very diverse in this early period. So in the second century church is when you see the appearance of the Deuteropauline epistles, these epistles written by a second Paul or someone writing in the name of Paul. And you have um, the sort of household codes of the Roman Empire entering into Christian writing, and uh, there's a clear uh, household hierarchy that's to be maintained in a respectable, godly household um, in the Christian household reflecting the ideal Roman household. Um, so wives are to be subject to their husbands. Uh, the next chapter, talking about slaves obeying their masters, you have a, a very clear hierarchy that shows a godly virtuous household uh, according to Greco-Roman norms. Uh, so it's here where you see 1 Timothy, that first passage we looked at, um, making sense in light of that historical moment in the second century, um, where women are now to be silent, they're now to be submissive. 
um, and they're not to have authority over a man. Um, and then sort of new interpretations coming in of the, tr of the Jewish Christian tradition, interpretations of the Adam and Eve story to uh, harmonize that with their own tradition. And in contrast to Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians, the undisputed Paul saying, don't get married, don't make social bonds. Uh, now this Paul is um, emphasizing the importance of childbearing and, and proliferating the next generation. So um, now that we've taken a peek at uh, the Pauline epistles uh, and their reference to Genesis, uh, I just want to spend a, a moment looking at the influences of Genesis stories on Christianity. We already saw there in that First Timothy passage a reference to the Adam and Eve story as a justification for women's silence and submission. Um, and I, I, would, I would say it definitely the Genesis creation stories, especially the Adam and Eve story, um, have been unparalleled in their influence on shaping thinking and arguments about the role of women in the history of Christianity and the history of the Western world. Uh, there's it, actually two creation stories in Genesis that are, have been harmonized over time. In Genesis chapter one, uh, you have one story where there's this um, God that speaks and things appear, um, this sort of transcendent being. Uh, and so God speaks and the land is separated from the water and appears and things are created in this orderly succession, and then male and female are created at the same time as the climax of creation at the end of this orderly creation process in uh, the first chapter of Genesis. Um, God created uh, humankind in his image, male and female, he created them. Uh, and so there's a sort of climactic moment where both male and female are created. Um, then you get another creation story starting in Genesis chapter two, going through chapter three, and this is the famous Adam and Eve story. And this colorful story becomes so prominent in Christian thinking that uh, the first story is sort of subordinate to it and um, often harmonized with it. Uh, sometimes it's explained that the first story is just kind of a brief summary of the detailed story that follows. Um, but there's too many differences to be able to convincingly make that argument in the, in, in the sense that the order of things created is different and so on. Uh, the language is quite different. Uh, even the language for God is different. Uh, but the Adam and Eve story, of course, has um, played a, a major role in the Western imagination. So uh, you have, as uh, the Paul, the Deutero Paul in 1 Timothy says, woman created after man, in the second creation story, um, and uh, Adam names her and calls her woman because out of man uh, she was taken. Uh, that picture I find kind of amusing. It's sort of uh, God handing Eve over to, to Adam, and he's like, for, for me? For, for me? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, in this, in this uh, version of the creation story, uh, God kind of makes a variety of animals at first to try to find a companion for Adam before he finally hatches upon the idea of creating this lovely creature for him. And that, that seems to make Adam happier than the animals. Um, okay, so um, you have Adam created first out of dust, then the God figure kind of creates the animals, uh, and then finally woman is created. Um, and you of course have these famous moments that unfold in the Garden of Eden. Um, God has told Adam that uh, he's not to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree, the forbidden fruit of, of this particular tree. Eve, nevertheless, listens to the serpent, takes the fruit, and Adam, who's been standing there with her during her whole conversation with the serpent, just nods and takes it and, and eats. Um, and then you have Adam blaming Eve there for the misdeed and their banishment from the garden. So you have um, a rich story here for many different interpretations uh, that, uh, is, that in and of itself is kind of interesting to look at the ways Christians have thought about this story throughout almost 2,000 years of Christian history. Um, one prominent way uh, it's been interpreted in Christian history is that um, 
when this, the woman becomes dominant at this moment where she's the actor and making the decision and the man is silently following her lead, that's when all hell breaks loose. Um, and you have uh, someone like Tertullian, an important church father in early Christianity, um, talking about how all women forevermore are cursed because of the actions of Eve. All women are daughters of Eve. And I'll just read this to you because I think it's such a powerful uh, statement of this perspective on women that emerges um, early on in Christianity. Where Tertullian says, do you not know that you are each an Eve? The sentence of God on this sex of yours lives in this age. The guilt must of, must of necessity live too. You are the devil's gateway. You are the unsealer of that forbidden tree. You are the first deserter of the divine law. You are she who persuaded him whom the devil was not valiant enough to attack. So the devil couldn't get Adam to go wrong, but Eve got him to go wrong. You destroyed so easily God's image, man. On account of your desert, that is death, even the Son of God had to die. Um, so women now bear the guilt of Eve for all time, and the social policy and church policy that develops from that is that a properly ordered society is one where women are under the control of man, and man covers woman and is sort of the intermediary between God and woman, um, rather than woman acting on her own. Uh, you have this long-standing Western tradition of women being the thing that can get men to go wrong more than anything else. Um, if it wasn't for woman, Adam would have lived his days happily in the Garden of Eden without ever eating from that tree. Um, here you have someone trying to live a lofty life of uh, rational thought and, and virtuous ways being tempted by the carnal lust of woman. Um, at times in Western history, uh, it takes a turn for uh, the kind of ridiculously um, macabre uh, with like the witch hunts and this famous uh, text uh, from the 15th, uh, 15th century during uh, witch hunts in Europe where they explain why it is that women are more likely to practice witchcraft than men. Um, and one passage from the text uh, talks about the natural reason women turn to the devil and to witchcraft uh, is because she is more carnal than man, as is clear from her many carnal abominations. And it should be noted that there was a defect in the formation of the first woman since she was formed from a bent rib, that is a rib of the breast, which is bent, as it were, in a contrary direction to man. And since through this defect she is an imperfect animal, she always deceives. Um, so even uh, the shape of the rib has been a basis of interpretation for why there's something wrong with women um, in, in Western history. Um, all witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which is in women, insatiable. So that um, curiosity and desire for the forbidden fruit um, lays a groundwork for a long Western tradition of women having uh, carnal, fleshly uh, proclivities um, which drag men down and all of creation down, um, away from God and from perfection. Okay, but that's one strain of Christian history and one particular interpretation. Um, there's many other images of women in the Christian tradition, including in um, the Christian scripture. Um, so we'll um, look at some prominent women in the Gospels now before turning it over to some discussion. Um, so we looked at the New Testament, starting with Paul, which uh, has uh, some of the earliest writings in the New Testament. Uh, and then, of course, there are the, the Gospels, the four Gospels in the New Testament, and also interesting new Gospels that have been discovered, not new uh, in terms of their time, but new to us since they've only been recently found by archaeologists. Um, but you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, which are very rich in stories with women and preserve this tradition about Jesus' interaction with women that are written down later on several decades after the actual Jesus movement started. Mary Magdalene, um, if you go back to the earliest Christian texts, is actually a very prominent figure, even though she is somewhat muted later on in, in Christian history. Um, here's an image of her um, reporting uh, the good news of Jesus' resurrection 
to the, dis the 12 disciples um, as, as depicted in the Gospel of John. One thing to note, and this is a tradition about her that develops in early Christianity, but isn't in the original uh, gospel writings about her, um, is that she's, she's actually never identified as a prostitute um, in the Bible, although there's so much lore and imagery about her being a prostitute that it's sometimes hard to think of her otherwise, like this 16th century painting where she's kind of brazenly wrapping her legs around the cross and uh, draped in, in pink, uh, bright pink cloth, um, you know, this her image of her as this sort of brazen prostitute in contrast to the virginal uh, figure of Mary there. Uh, but if you go back to the original um, texts about her, she's one of the only uh, figures, uh, only women that appear in all four of the canonical gospels, the four gospels in the New Testament. She's there um, at the crucifixion of Jesus, um, there at the crucifixion of Jesus and Mark when all the male disciples have fled in terror. Um, and in John, she's the one that he appears to and first uh, reveals uh, the, the news that he's, he's been raised from the dead, the, the central message of this Christian tradition that becomes the Christian tradition. Um, and she's the one that tells this to the apostles. And so in early Christianity, she was often referred to as the apostle to the apostles. Um, and uh, as she had the first role of apostle, that is sharing the news of Jesus' resurrection. Interestingly, uh, she has an even more prominent role in some of the recently discovered um, Gnostic Gospels uh, that were unearthed in the 20th century, um, which have revealed this whole other Christian tradition that existed in the early period uh, when there was a wide diversity of Christian scriptures and traditions uh, before they were kind of unified in the fourth century. Uh, so these are non-canonical Gospels, meaning they're not in the New Testament canon, but uh, Gospels that some early Christian groups thought of as scripture and as, as truth. Uh, so one of the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Philip, um, Mary Magdalene has this very interesting and provocative role. And uh, there's other Gospels, like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, that's a non-canonical Gospel, where she's also seen as this, this prominent disciple. And it's, it's almost like the Gnostic groups that preserved these texts seem to think of her as the chief disciple of Jesus rather than anyone else. Uh, so in the Gospel of Philip, uh, it talks about three who always walked with the Lord, Mary's mother and her sister, and Magdalene, the one who was called his companion. And this was sort of the basis, if you remember the whole um, Da Vinci Code um, excitement a few years ago. Um, some of his uh, fantasy was based on uh, the Gnostic Gospels and the references to Mary Magdalene here. Uh, these Gospels are usually dated uh, to the second or third century and are not um, considered to be as early as the Gospels that are in the New Testament. Um, but they, they give us a window, and window into this very interesting Christian tradition that really saw a prominent role for this figure. And we know from the New Testament Gospels as well that something's going on there with Mary Magdalene being a prominent figure in early Christianity and that she shows up in all these different early Christian Gospels. Uh, this is the part uh, that drives um, scholars crazy. So the um, text they found of the Gospel of Philip is a corrupt text. There's holes in it, so you can't read the whole thing. And so the most interesting parts seem to be missing. Um, so it says here in the companion of the hole, Mary Magdalene blank, loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her blank. Like there's a hole right there, you know, and they're, they're like, if only, if only we knew how they, how they finished that sentence. Um, so there's some, you know, people's imaginations can start working here that, you know, what did they think the relationship was of Mary Magdalene and Jesus? Uh, and interestingly, uh, in the Gnostic Gospels, Jesus clearly loves her more than anyone else. In the Gospel of John, uh, John is the beloved disciple. But in the Gospel of Mary, Mary is the beloved disciple and other Gnostic Gospels. Uh, so the rest of the disciples are kind of jealous. And if you know the New Testament Gospels, they, they were prone to jealousy a lot. Of, um, but the rest of the disciples are also jealous in this Gnostic Gospel. They said to Jesus, why do you love her more than all of us? And the Savior answered and said to them, why do I not love you like her? 
And he's a, he's a very cryptic Jesus in the Gnostic Gospels. <laughs> okay. So in the Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, he gives her the secret knowledge, the gnosis, that the Gnostic Christians believes was necessary for salvation, that only the special chosen few were given the capacity to understand. And Mary Magdalene is the first one that's given that key knowledge. But that really parallels the Orthodox Christian tradition in the Gospel of John, where she's the first to be given the key knowledge of that tradition, his resurrection. And then she shares that knowledge with the disciples in this parallel way to the Gnostic Gospels. Okay, so we have Mary Magdalene uh, playing this very interesting and prominent role in early Christian writings. Um, although she's later sort of subdued and, and not as noticeable in the Christian tradition as stories about her being kind of this disreputable woman start circulating. She certainly is a very independent woman who travels alone with the Jesus group, even in the canonical Gospels. And so later Christians are kind of suspicious of her morality. Um, turning to Mary, the mother of Jesus in the New Testament, uh, we have another uh, very, of course, uh, prominent female figure, although she's not as uh, prominent and prevalent in the New Testament as you might expect. Um, she certainly featured prominently in the two nativity scenes of two of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Uh, Mark and John don't have nativity scenes. Um, and then in John, uh, she, like Mary Magdalene, uh, appears at really pivotal moments in the life of Jesus. In John, Mary, his mother, initiates his first miracle at the wedding of Cana, he turns the water into wine at the suggestion of his mother, uh, which becomes the scriptural basis of the Catholic tradition, uh, seeing Mary as this really significant intercessor between people and Jesus. Um, and then she's there at his crucifixion, um, along with Mary Magdalene. But a lot of uh, the more elaborate doctrines and stories about Mary, the mother of Jesus, come from other early Christian writings that are not in the New Testament um, and become part of the Orthodox and Catholic tradition. Um, the Emphasy Gospel of James, which is an early piece of Christian writing that's not in the New Testament, um, gives many more details about Mary than you find in the New Testament and are on the basis of uh, numerous traditions about her um, in, in Catholic and Orthodox churches. Uh, so it's in this uh, non-New Testament, non-biblical, non-canonical gospel or um, text that her parents are named and, and appear. They don't appear in the New Testament texts. Um, and it's here where you get reference to Mary's own conception. Um, this is where St. Anne comes from, the mother of Mary. She's not mentioned in the New Testament, but in, in the infancy gospel of James. And in medieval uh, Catholic art, uh, Mary is always portrayed with her mother, Anne. And uh, there, Anne's sort of prominently standing behind Mary and the infant Jesus. And sort of like, if you really want an intercessor, don't just go to the mother of God, but go to the mother of mother of God. And then you might uh, really uh, have some, some weight there in your prayers. Um, so Mary's conception, then, is where the idea of the Immaculate Conception comes from. Um, many people often think that the Immaculate Conception is a reference to Jesus's virgin conception. But the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception in the Catholic tradition is a reference to the conception of Mary, that Anne, um, when she conceived Mary, even though she was not a virgin when she conceived her, when she conceived her, the, the miracle is that Mary herself is conceived without the stain of original sin, because she needed to be this pure vessel to carry the Son of God. And so her own conception is miraculous and immaculate, um, so that she can then in turn carry the Son of God. The virgin life, uh, based on these early traditions about Mary and her perpetual virginity, um, continue through, through the Christian tradition, throughout much of Christian history, and provides an avenue for women um, during the Middle Ages, for example, to have a life set apart uh, from that sort of life of the daughters of Eve. Um, some women could be the daughters of Mary and live a life um, reflecting the Virgin Mary. Um, through the convent life, women uh, who 
entered the convent could access learning, literacy, and become quite prominent intellectuals and, and writers and poets in their own right, uh, such as Hildegard of Bingen um, of the 12th century, uh, was one of the most highly respected women of her day. She would write letters to the Pope and he would answer them. Um, and uh, people would just clamor for her writings and her artwork and her music. Um, and she really uh, celebrated um, the, the mother, the almost, almost getting to this idea of this divine mother almost, where everything uh, joyful has been created through the mother, through the womb of the mother. Um, and her visions that she would illuminate there, sort of reflecting, um, sort of throwbacks to old sort of pre-Christian pre um, nature religion. Much of her artwork was a celebration of the female and of the woman, um, especially inspired by the Virgin Mary herself. Um, writing the consummate benediction and is in womanly form beyond all creation since God was made human and a virgin most sweet and blessed. Um, and much of the imagery really evokes uh, the female anatomy and um, all things sort of female and celebrating it in this really um, unprecedented way. So um, you have these different strains of the Christian tradition, some uh, demonizing women, others celebrating the feminine in this really remarkable way. Um, and today um, you have ongoing um, diversity and discussion and, off, and more often than not conflict around the role of women um, in Christianity. Certainly the proper interpretation of the Bible and all its complexity is often at the center of these debates within Christianity. But especially after the um, feminist movement of the past half century, um, Christianity has, um, and as other religions, has really struggled with how to accommodate changing mores and expectations about the role of women in society. Um, is Christianity something that can be compatible with modern sort of post-feminist ideas of women? Um, or is it a place where uh, there's going to be a preservation of, of pre-feminist and pre-modern ideas about women. And there's very firm um, stakes in, in both sides of this debate. Uh, so uh, you have a number of Protestant traditions, uh, for example, that have developed interpretations of the Bible uh, that harmonize the Bible with uh, feminist thought. And you have this outpouring of feminist theology and feminist biblical interpretation. Um, you have things like the... Episcopal Church of the U.S. having a woman who's the presiding bishop, Bishop Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, um, the United Methodist Church, and others have allowed women's full ordination since the mid-20th century. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, Protestant movements uh, really seeing that as, as an abomination to uh, really uh, holding true to uh, the inerrancy of the Bible. Uh, really taking seriously all those passages in the Bible we looked at as, as God breathed and, and not to be um, dismissed. Uh, so you have uh, really influential organizations in, in the conservative evangelical world, for example, like the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, which was formed in 1986 to counter the influence of Christian feminism um, and this uh, influential book they published, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, author John Piper there, um, talking about how people have lost sight of the importance of women's submission and women's uh, traditional pre-modern roles in the modern world and how that's the true path to um, happiness and a virtuous household uh, in the modern world, just like Christians were striving to have a virtuous household in the Roman Empire. Um, organizations like uh, Southern Baptist seminaries have developed their own women's studies programs, but their women's studies programs focused on evoking biblical womanhood uh, and the, the sort of pre-modern idea of women. Um, so uh, Mary, Mary Cassian is a prominent uh, speaker and a distinguished professor at Southern Baptist Seminary um, who wrote a book called The Feminist Mistake, um, talking about how Christians uh, straight off of their true path when they started accommodating to modern notions of feminism. Uh, so that's a really prominent strain in 
Protestant Christianity today as well, right alongside the movements to ordain women and the feminist movements. Uh, the Catholic Church, uh, the women have always had a very, very active role in the Catholic Church, of course, um, going back to the, um, the nuns of the Middle Ages through uh, sisters today who are very active in social justice, um, right at the forefront of social justice efforts around the world. Um, but of course the Vatican, um, as I think most people know is kind of common knowledge, um, is quite firm in rejecting the idea of women's ordination, even though there's a very lively uh, pro-women's ordination movement within the Catholic Church and this sort of underground women priest movement uh, where some bishops secretly ordained some women who've now conferred ordination onto other women in the Catholic Church. Uh, on their website, you can find a Catholic woman priest in your area if you're interested. Okay, um, so those are just uh, some sketches of uh, images of women in the history of Christianity. But I'd like to open it up now to any thoughts or discussion points uh, people would like to bring up in the audience.